Oi, oi, it's your boy, Slacky J, coming at you on Wednesday, the 20th of October for the Boycast. And um, yeah, we've got some fights coming up this weekend. We've got what I, I've i just, I'm going to describe it as a comedy and a tragedy. We've got a comedy going to unfold between Paulo Costa and Marvin Vittori, and then a tragedy unfolding with Fedor versus Tim Johnson uh, on the Bellator card. But we'll lead with uh, Costa versus Vittori because. I can't see any way this doesn't end up funny, at least, because you got two of the beefiest, angriest, stupidest people in MMA, um, and they're going to come out and, and do bad game plans against each other. Um, in fairness, I think v Vittori probably has the better chance of having a bad game plan. Paul Acosta just does the same thing under all circumstances, which is just try and overwhelm people. And I think they're both the same sort of fighter in that they're not, I wouldn't call either like a power hitter, but more like a strong hitter. Like they just, uh, they bludgeon people. They're not very crisp. They don't like knock people out in one good punch. Um, you know, Vittori's power is, is very interesting because he's been able to turn back people like um, Jack Hermanson. Um, but if, like almost no knockouts on his record. All his finishes are by submission. Uh, and, and yeah, he keeps being heralded as this amazing kickboxer because he came from kickboxing. But they're both coming off fights with Israel Adesanya. Um, Paulo Costa has taken a long time to get back in action. I believe he was booked against Whitaker at one point, um, but has had a lot of different issues. He got, I think, he got COVID at one point. Um, he he he's basically had some kind of mental breakdown off the Izzy loss. He took it incredibly badly. He was, you know, trying trying to tell everyone that he had a drinking problem and he was drinking too much wine before the fight or whatever it was. But, um, you know, you would expect that to happen or you would expect some kind of mental blow up to happen because he has been met with, well, everyone he's met has just folded under the fire that he offers. Um, except, you know, Yo Romero, but it still worked against him. And then he was completely diffused by uh, Israel Adesanya. It wasn't like it wasn't like Izzy was made of metal and could just take what uh, Costa was dishing out. It's just that what di Costa was dishing out wasn't working because Adesanya was moving and um, catching his kicks and countering. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's got to be very disheartening for that to happen, for, for you to be this powerhouse that everyone's afraid of. And then you're throwing stuff at this guy and it's just not catching him. It's not working. Meanwhile, Marvin Vittori had a decent third round against Israel Adesanya in their fight, their first fight, and then came into the rematch with the god-awful plan of just trying to double-leg him over and over again. Very strange. And and Rafael Cordero being like, you're doing great, just keep throwing, the, just keep diving on the double-leg. <laughs> um, but against each other, I mean, that's compelling. Uh, you know, Vittori's wrestling is good. Um, that could break the pressure from... Costa. Costa's very interesting because he's a pressure fighter, but he's not a very competent uh, ring general. And we pointed this out in the big Filthy Casuals guide to Adesanya versus Costa that I did. I said, you know, he's been able to corner everyone and beat them up and uh, walk them into round kicks to the body as they circle along the fence. But he's not really for anyone who knows what they're doing from there. It's, it's like when people were raving about Ronda Rousey's, you know... I was saying Ronda Rousey has bad ring craft, or I've never seen her demonstrate good ring craft. She just sort of runs after people. She had actually demonstrated bad ring craft by just sort of running on a straight line with her feet in a line and almost tripping over. Um, but people were like, oh, you, you know, if she if, if the opponent circles out, they'll, she'll just run faster and catch up with her. It is not how it works. You can't tell how good someone's ring craft actually is uh, until you see them fight someone who knows what they're doing. And Israel Adesanya knows what he's doing. I mean, I was watching the first... Within the first 10 seconds of the Vittori fight, he circles one way along the fence, circles back the other and escapes off it after Vittori seemed to, to be like having a moment of pushing him towards the fence. Um, direction changes are the most important thing regarding defensive ring craft or, or elusive ring craft. Um, and no one had done it to Paulo Costa until Israel, Israel Adesanya did. And uh, it made him look like absolute crap. If you stand there and, and just sort of like take the punches, Paulo Costa's a monster. I'd be very, very scared of him. But um, for the most part, you know, if you can move decently, you can limit a lot of what he can do. And also he relies so heavily on like that big round kick to the body 
um, which uh, he fought a few southpaws actually. Um, oh, who was that lad? Gerald something or other. But he's fought a few south uh, southpaws in his in his run, and that's basically meant that when they're circling along the fence, he's punting straight into the body with his right leg. Of course, when you fight an orthodox fighter and you start throwing right kicks to the body, well, I mean, go and watch some high level Muay Thai and. Um, you will notice that overwhelmingly guys go to the open side because you can't just lift your arm up and, and take the kick on your ribs and then catch it underneath, whereas you can just take it on your back. Like You, you move with it like Israel Adesanya did, but um, you don't even need to a lot of the time. If you just take a kick on your back, it's going to hurt, but it's not going to like devastate you like a kick on the ribs will. But having said that, Marvin Vittori is a southpaw, so that's quite intriguing, that aspect of it. Um... Vittori's done quite well as the bully in a couple of his recent ones, like Hermanson, but I've seen him fight on the back foot like against um, Andrew Sanchez, um, or, you know, points of that fight. Costa's got this nice lean back left hook that he was landing a lot against uh, Romero. Um, Vittori has the nice uh, outside slip to, to left straight over the top, the open side counter. Also had a nice, he, he used the uppercut version of that a couple of times against uh, Adesanya. I think it would be very interesting because what I've seen from Vittori, I think he's fast enough that he can land good counters on uh, Costa as he comes in. I just, the difference is going to be what he does after them. You know, it's exactly like we were talking about Soriano and, and Todorovic the other day. Beating a guy to the punch is is half the battle. But uh, unless you're, there's, there's so much, when you see guys being beaten to the punch in boxing, there's a lot going on after that, you know. Um, guys can throw punches while their head's being jacked back. Guys can throw punches with their eyes closed, like M Megan Anderson does. Um, you got to hit, and then you got to move your head, or you got to close to clinch, or you got to you got to do something, side step off. You know, you've you've got to look after yourself defensively. It's uh, it's similar to what we used to call the pattern of offense. You know, you enter, you land your techniques, and you exit. And the exit part is the part that is really easy to forget. Uh, and you see guys do it in their shadow boxing all the time. You know, you you drill yourself to just throw the punches, and then you go, yeah, that was pretty nice. And, and really, you need to be throwing the punches and exiting. You know, one exit or another, doesn't matter what, or close to the clinch or, you know, level change. But if Vittori can do that, if you can clip off a good counter and then change levels into um, Costa's chest, tie him up or, or uh, duck out the side door, then I'll be very um, confident of his chances in the fight. I think you've got a good chance of seeing Vittori crack Costa in the head with good counters, you know, fatten his lips up like uh, the old Romero did, and then still get bludgeoned by three or four swinging hooks afterwards. Because that's the thing, like, Paulo Costa, it's very easy to think of him as like a bully who had a breakdown because of Israel Adesanya, because of Izzy uh, working him out, but it wasn't the being hit part that was hard for him, it was the not being able to hit the other guy part that was so disheartening. Um, the Yo Romero fight is a fantastic example where he just stood there with Yo Romero, traded punches and ground him down, um, or or lost a decision. If you if you uh, think that Romero won that, but you know that was a for for someone who's who's booked you know who's who, for someone who's considered like a bully that was very uncharacteristic in in terms of like bullies are people who when you hit them they don't like that they like to be dominating the entire time what he seems to be is someone who gets very disheartened if he can't hit you um so intrigued to see how that plays out wrestling is going to be interesting uh, on the subject of wrestling and paul acosta there's a great clip of uh, logan paul went to whatever eric alba uh, camp is called um great guy great team but uh and he, he was training with costa and they, it was just to like do some sparring in, in boxing gloves and do like the oh I got knocked out by Paulo Costa thing, um, but then they did some grappling and like it's uh, just Costa mounting him and <laughs> like grinding on him uh, and then he does a, a quick bridge and, and escapes out and you're like well damn that's pretty cool uh, and then there's another separate clip of them wrestling and Logan Paul pretty fucking good for an MMA fighter you know uh, uh, you know in MMA context rather like. Uh, you know, didn't win any state titles or anything like that, but clearly competent enough that Paulo Costa's having real trouble getting him off his feet. And he hit a really nice wizard throw on um, Costa in, in that clip. But uh, yeah, I, I just love sending that to people who are like, ah, oh, Valentina would finish them both in zero seconds or whatever it was she said. 
But yeah, the grappling's going to be interesting. Vittori, I've been quite impressed by his wrestling lately. Uh, more impressed, like, his defensive wrestling um, when Hermanson was trying to get him, uh, you know, using high crotches to crack him down and he was still just scrambling his way up. Um, his, his takedown attempts against Izzy were uh, basic, is how I'd describe them. You know, it, it, the guy has proven to be brilliant at, at propping himself up on the fence. I don't understand why your your game plan is to just keep plowing in and ducking on his hips. And I've seen so many fights just stagnate with the guy with his head in the hips trying to finish the double against the fence. You know, not even switching off to the single a lot of the time. But the way he should have fought that, I mean, there was a great... The third round of their first fight was great. It was a great example of, of how you can frustrate Izzy a bit. And a huge part of that was the double jab. The double jab set up this double leg because he had... Uh, Israel Adesanya moving around but what he should have been doing was double jabbing Israel Adesanya back and then landing good low kicks or good body kicks or trying to land some good punches and then mix in the takedowns later but it was just constant towards the fence dive on the hips you know it was um, very predictable dealing with a guy who is getting by on his smarts and his uh, well-drilled smart skills and you're trying to like just power through him by showing him the same thing over and over again but anyway, um, that fight should be fun. I hope. <laughs> I hope because this is there. I realize they're also both at the stage in their career where, having had that recent one-sided loss, they're both going to be like, "Well, I'm going to show I can fight to the game plan just to get one win back in the win column, and then I'll go back to being my usual self." Um, so it could be a snoozer, but I, I highly doubt it. They're both too dumb to to have a snoozer. So what else is on this card? Grant Dawson versus Rick Glenn. That's fairly fun. Uh, uh, Tr- Trinaldo is on this card, apparently. Where is he? Oh, he's fighting Dwight Grant. There you go. Who I confused with Grant, Grant Dawson. I just have to write Dwight Black Grant White on my hand. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm always up for some Fr- Francisco Trinaldo. Masaranduba. I don't even know what that means. But um, coming off the loss to Muslim Salakoff, that was a fun one, actually. Uh, and then he was on a win, free, uh, three fight win streak before that with uh, Bobby Green, John McDacy, and Jai Herbert. We're back up at welterweight now. You know the loss to Selikov hasn't put him off that because the the win streak was at lightweight. So it's clearly just you know, I'm getting too old for this shit. Uh, even if you lose the fight, just stay at welterweight. It's it's less effort. Uh, and and I suppose there's something interesting to be said for that too with um, Jessica Rose Clark on the card. I've actually watched a couple of her fights recently because. I I know her as a successful um, thirst trapper. She she's one of those uh, girls who's made the transition between women's MMA and thirst trapping very well. Not quite to the level of Kay Hansen, who is apparently in like the top three percent of only fan only fans accounts. Um, but Jessica Rose Clark, I mean, she I, I she's got a lot more fights in the UFC than I remember her having. But I watched her last few, and I was actually really impressed because she's tiny. And she's trying to fight a bantamweight because she was down at flyweight and she said the cut was too much for her. She had to pull out a one because of a failed weight cut. And she's gone up to bantamweight again. But she's only like 5'5". Five, five. Um, you know, when you compare that to like Amanda Nunes, I think it's like 5'9". Um, but her last one was a lot of fun. Uh, really nice use of elbows in the clinch and knees. Um, the girl she was fighting did not seem to know what she was doing. I mean, she had wins, and she, I presume she was a decent grappler. She got some good takedowns in that fight. But she'd hit, like, Jessica Rose Clark would be on the fence, and she'd push this girl's face away and then drop her onto the elbow, the old JDS framing elbow. And the girl who was attempting the takedown would get hit with the elbow and then turn her back, so she'd turn to face the middle of the cage and give up her back. And like, there's, there's no advantage to that. That's just you freaking out. But that one ended really weird because she hit a... The girl, I mean, she had a load of bad reactions to getting hit, this other girl. But she got backed up against the fence. She was being chopped up with elbows and knees. It was really nice work from Jessica Rose Clark. But she, Jessica Rose Clark grabbed a double collar tie and this girl sat down into a squat along the fence and got kneed in the nose and it broke her nose all over her face. And there was a big, like, there was a pause in the action while they checked the film to check if it was a legal knee or not. But nobody does that. You don't sit down against the fence. You know, to try and to try and game the knee or whatever. Um, yeah, so I wasn't super impressed by her opponent, but I thought she looked good. Uh, even in the fight against Pani uh, Kianzad, who'd beaten her once already, I think, in Invicta, um, I thought she looked quite good, despite losing. And she said she came into that one really light. Um, so, yeah. 
Not bad hands, not bad grappling, and use of elbows and knees, which is the thing that I'm always saying. More female MMA fighters, you know, they, there's no two ways about it. There aren't a lot of uh, women's MMA fighters who can uh, consistently produce good hitting power on their punches. That could be to do with muscle mass on the upper body. That could be to do with weight because they're all quite light compared to, you know, the big middleweights we got fighting in um, the main event. But elbows and knees hurt no matter who you are. You know, watch like the best, the best neck boy in the world are like 115 pounds, but uh, they're still cutting the fuck out of people with elbows and hurting them with knees. It's a large unpadded surface uh, that you can just jam into someone over and over again. So yeah, I've turned a corner on her because I, I just knew her as this person that people were super horny for. But um, yeah, she, she seemed cool in the post-fight interview with the Sarah Alpa. Alpa fight, and she seems to have a good idea of what she's what she should be doing. You know, putting more focus on the knees and the elbows, especially from the clinch, uh, especially when guys can't finish clean or uh, girls can't finish clean takedowns against you. If you've got good enough um, takedowns to hold yourself up, why not try and use the quote unquote Muay Thai clinch? What else do I like on this card? We've got Alex Caceres versus Sun Wu Choi. Um, yeah. That's all right. I mean, Alex Caceres has been around forever. <laughs> had thirty, no, had forty fights. Lost half of them. Ain't killed a motherfucker yet. But um, yeah, he, he has his moments. 